No radiologist is absolutely perfect. However, we all endeavor to be as close to perfect as possible. In order to do that, it's critical for us to understand what kinds of errors we're at risk of making as radiologists and how they happen so that we can avoid them. We typically use the term discrepancy to describe any situation where what appears in a radiology report is different from the subsequent outcome. We use the term error to describe discrepancies that differ substantially from what the consensus of our radiologist peers would have been. Take this calcified one millimeter left upper lobe lung nodule that was reported by a radiologist as a granuloma, but turned out to be an osteosarcoma metastasis. Although the call of a granuloma was incorrect, it's probably what many radiologists would have done in this situation, and therefore a discrepancy rather than an error. If on the other hand, a radiologist was reading a slightly later CT study and saw that this nodule had grown, but still insisted on calling the nodule a granuloma, that'd probably be an error since most radiologists would have been uncomfortable calling a nodule that grew this much a granuloma. It's important to point out that most discrepancies and errors do not occur due to negligence, but to other reasons, many of which we'll talk about. The good news is that it's in our power to mitigate many of these factors, but the bad news is we probably can't absolutely eliminate them either. Before I show you the next slide, I wanted to put those numbers you're about to see in context. When you look at the literature, it's not uncommon to see folks reporting the prevalence of interpretive errors to be around 30%, like in this study by weight in 2017, which seems shockingly high. However, these sort of figures are often in studies where every case contained an abnormality. In the real world, however, a large proportion of the cases we read are normal, and a 3 to 5% interpretive error rate with more typical um, normal abnormal ratios like Siegel reported in the late 1990s are probably closer to reality. All right, now let's move on to the next slide. These are three studies looking at the interpretive error rates of radiologists in the 1950s, 1970s, and 2000s. I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a close look at these numbers to see if you notice something interesting. Isn't it funny how the error rates of radiologists in these studies are all about the same, whether the study was in the 1950s, 1970s, or 2000s? Or, regardless of whether the studies were chest x-rays on film or abdominal CTs on PACs? These kind of numbers suggest that the root cause of radiologist error may be independent of error, imaging technology, or specialty, but rather inherent to how humans process information and think. And this is an issue with pretty huge consequences besides the obvious undesirable patient outcomes and their medical legal ramifications. Dealing with the consequences of interpretive errors consumes resources and healthcare dollars that could be used for other purposes. And the size of this issue is pretty breathtaking when you consider that over 3 billion x-ray studies are performed worldwide every year. Interpretive errors that a radiologist might make can be divided into two major buckets, perceptual errors and cognitive errors. Perceptual errors happen when a radiologist fails to see a finding that turns out to be visible in retrospect. What's interesting about perceptual errors is that their rates appear to be independent of whether you're a resident or tenured attending, whether you're reading x-ray or MRI, whether you're reading trauma bay or oncology, or whether you're reading in the United States or anywhere else in the world. With cognitive errors, the radiologist successfully sees the abnormal finding, but incorrectly understands its meaning. Communication errors are neither perceptual or cognitive, but errors that occur when a radiologist saw the finding, correctly understood its meaning, but somehow that understanding was not successfully conveyed to the referring provider or patient. It would be like if a radiologist saw a speculated lung nodule, correctly called it lung cancer, but somehow the message that there was a lung cancer never made it 
to the referring provider or patient. Communication errors are considered non-interpretive errors, and we'll talk about them in a different presentation. But this talk is one we'll focus on interpretive errors on, those of perception and those of cognition. There are 11 kinds of interpretive errors in radiology, five kinds that are perceptual errors, five kinds that are cognitive errors, and one that's both perceptual and cognitive. In this talk, we'll review each of these errors and discuss biases that make some of these errors more likely to occur. If you plot these 11 kinds of interpretive errors on a Pareto chart, you can see that three kinds of errors, under reading, satisfaction of search, and faulty reasoning, account for almost three quarters of all interpretive errors by radiologists. Underreading errors. Underreading errors can occur in several ways. Sometimes it's a scanning error, when a radiologist's gaze never made it at all to the region of the image where a pertinent finding was. Sometimes it's a recognition error, when a radiologist did gaze at the region of the image the finding was, but not long enough to notice it. Sometimes it's an interpretation error, when a radiologist did gaze at the region of the image the finding was, gazed long enough to see the finding, but then dismissed it as inconsequential. An example of a scanning error is this case of left internal mammary chain lymphadenopathy. The internal mammary lymph node chains were not part of the search pattern of the first year resident reading this chest CT at the time, so their gaze never made it to this location. An example of a recognition error was this medial left breast cancer. Although the chest wall was part of the trainee's visual search pattern during their CT read, they didn't catch the breast nodule while scrolling through this area. Here's the um, ultrasound of that breast nodule, by the way, demonstrating that the nodule was hypoechoic and taller than it is wide, a feature that has an almost 80% positive predictive value for breast cancer. Inattention bias makes underreading errors more likely. Inattention bias is a tendency we have as humans to miss things that we aren't actively paying attention for. This was demonstrated in a well-known study where 24 radiologists were asked to look for lung nodules on chest CT images, and 83% failed to notice there was an image of a gorilla in the lung. Recognition error and inattention bias were summed up pretty well by one of my older attendings when I was a resident, who would always say, you don't see what you don't look for. Inattention bias not only predisposes a radiologist to miss the presence of an abnormal finding that they aren't paying attention for, but it also predisposes a radiologist to miss the absence of a normal finding they weren't expecting either. Like in this example, where the clavicles were missing in a case of cleidocranial dysostosis. And finally, I'd like to show you an example of interpretation error. Typically, when intravenous contrast is injected into one arm, unenhanced venous blood from the other arm mixes in the SVC with the enhanced venous blood from the injected arm to form an apparent filling defect. The individual who viewed this CT looked at the SVC, saw a filling defect within the contrast pool of the SVC, and then called this normal mixing artifact instead of what it really was, a thrombus in the SVC. Factors like fatigue, excessive workloads, suboptimal viewing conditions, and distractions are known to increase the likelihood of making an underreading error. The best remedies for underreading errors are to develop consistent and comprehensive visual search patterns, and to practice techniques to reduce your visual fatigue, such as the 20-20-20 rule. For every 20 minutes you spend looking at the pack screen, you should try to look away at something that is at least 20 feet away from you for a total of 20 seconds. Other remedies are to do our best to reduce disruptions and to strive to break our work into more sustainable blocks of time and case volumes. Finally, knowing the most commonly occurring under-reading errors is important. Missed lung nodules, missed fractures and skeletal metastases in the spine and pelvis on x-rays, and bone lesions 
blood clots, and GI tumors on CT. Satisfaction of search errors. Satisfaction of search errors occur when a radiologist prematurely stops or eases off their visual search for, for additional abnormal findings after they find an initial abnormality. Most people will see the rib fracture on this image, but will they also see the scapular fracture and the pneumothorax? The best remedies for satisfaction of search errors are to have a systematic checklist approach to reading studies. And structured reports can sometimes help. And to be aware of abnormal findings that commonly cluster together, like rib fractures, pneumothoraces, and hemothoraces on chest imaging. Faulty reasoning errors. With interpretation errors, a radiologist sees a pertinent finding and dismisses it. With faulty reasoning errors, a radiologist sees a pertinent finding and identifies it as abnormal but then goes on to attribute the abnormal finding to the wrong cause. Sometimes the reason is insufficient data, like when the clinical information we're provi provided for a case is misleading, or if our own differential diagnoses are too narrow. Sometimes, however, it might be due to anchoring bias. Like dogs with a bone, sometimes as humans, we latch on to an impression early in the interpretation process and are hesitant to let it go, even as conflicting information begins to arise as the interpretation continues. Sometimes faulty reasoning errors occur because of framing bias, where how a case is presented affects our perceptions of what is more likely or less likely an explanation for an abnormal finding. Do you interpret subtle interstitial lung opacities slightly different where they're, when they're coming from an ILD clinic than when they're coming from the ED? Availability bias can also predispose us to making faulty reasoning errors. Many of us have probably had that experience when you're in the market for a new car and you suddenly start seeing that kind of car everywhere. It happens in radiology too. We tend to latch onto diagnoses that are at the top of our minds perhaps because we may have missed a recent case of one, or perhaps we just sat through a talk about them. Premature closure is another type of bias that predisposes us to making faulty reasoning errors. It's the tendency for us to prematurely stop looking for reasonable alternative explanations for an abnormal finding once we come up with a suitable initial explanation. Finally, Zebra retreat is another sort of bias that can predispose us to making a faulty reasoning error. As physicians were often taught, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. However, rare diagnoses do occasionally occur and are sometimes missed, even with good supporting evidence because a radiologist is disinclined to make a rare diagnosis. This case of Berthog Dubé which is a rare syndrome characterized by lower lung cysts, renal tumors, and skin lesions, was originally interpreted as a relatively unremarkable chest CT with just a few blebs and air cysts. Strategies for avoiding faulty reasoning errors require us to remedy anchoring bias by checking the urge to make early guesses when we're reading a case, by challenging ourselves to disprove the initial diagnoses we make, and have an open mind to the opinions of others. We can minimize faulty reasoning errors by avoiding framing biases. Try interpreting images before glancing at the clinical indication. Be more aggressive in seeking additional clinical information before you finalize a report for diagnoses in which clinical context is important, like in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Address availability bias by being self-conscious of our human tendency to overestimate diagnoses we may have recently missed or read about. Know the base rate of the diseases you diagnose. And for higher volume cases and diagnoses, try to get a fix on how you benchmark relative to your colleagues if you can. Finally, insist yourself on generating differential diagnoses in your head as much as possible and avoid the temptation to be a gunslinger radiologist. Being cognizant of and having an effective game plan for under-reading 
satisfaction of search and faulty reasoning is three quarters of the battle. Let's go through the other eight types of errors that make up the other 25% of interpretive errors. Location errors. Location errors are what radiologists also call corner of the film errors. These are errors where a pertinent finding is present but outside of the visual field of interest, like at the very edge of an image or on the very first or very last image of a CT series, particularly an ancillary one like an expiratory phase chest CT series. On this cardiac CT, for example, there was something sort of abnormal in the partially imaged right perihilar region of the lung near the margin of this cardiac FOV that turned out to be ABPA. A standard approach to your visual search pattern that purposely incorporates imaging regions you may be more likely to overlook is one remedy to minimize location errors. Make it a point to look at the upper and lower extremes of CT scout images because anatomy in those locations may not, may not always be included in the CT volume. Remind yourself to check the abdominal organs on expiratory phase chest CT images because a part of the upper abdomen can get imaged on the expiratory phase that isn't included in the normal inspiratory phase chest CT acquisition when the diaphragm is lower. Technique errors. Technique errors are errors introduced by limitations of the study itself, like this example of a type A aortic dissection that could not be diagnosed on the original CTA due to poor intravenous contrast bolus timing. Some technique errors are unavoidable. However, having rigorous QC and standard work will help ensure you can avoid at least some of them. Complication errors. Complication errors are generally workflow errors. Errors when the wrong patient gets imaged and are placed in another patient's folder. Errors when the wrong body part is imaged or when the wrong procedure is performed. This was a case of a complication error that happened after a nodule was correctly identified in a patient's mid right lung. The follow-up chest x-ray was read as resolution of the right lung nodule when in actuality, a different patient was, actually, was accidentally imaged and put into the original patient's folder. Strict adherence to well-designed standard workflows is one step in minimizing complication errors. Standard workflows that include two-factor patient identification, active questioning throughout the workflow, for example, asking for the patient's name in the waiting room, in the dressing room, in the prep area, as they're getting on the scanner or asking what study they're here for. Standard workflows that involve asking patients open-ended questions rather than yes-no questions. Since patients who don't hear well or who are confused may answer yes even if they don't answer, if, even if they don't understand your question. For example, it's much safer to ask, what's your name, than to ask, are you John Smith? As a last line of defense, nurture a healthy skepticism in the reading room. If a solid lung nozzle that looked sort of suspicious magically disappears, does that seem plausible? Satisfaction of report errors. Satisfaction of report errors occur due to alliterative bias, when our interpretation of the current study is biased by the report of the prior study. This can happen in different contexts, like when the prior study was read by a senior colleague in your department, or when you're reading out a resident and are biased by their preliminary interpretation. One remedy to minimizing this type of error is to read prior radiology reports after your interpretation. When I'm reading out residents, I also generally prefer to do my own read first and then look at their report. Lack of knowledge errors. Lack of knowledge errors are errors that occur because of the radiologist's own lack of knowledge. If a young radiologist had never seen or even read about pulmonary echinococcus, it's possible they'd miss this diagnosis in this case. History errors. History errors occur 
when the clinical history provided for a study is incomplete, inaccurate, or misleading. Like in this case, for which the provided reason for the study was lung screening, but the referring provider was actually asking us to screen for pulmonary AVMs, not lung cancer. Fortunately, this was caught during CT protocoling before the scan was performed. Overreading errors. Overreading errors are false positive errors where a normal finding is interpreted as abnormal. Like this case that was thought to represent bilateral pneumothoraces, but was just a case with overlapping skin folds. Or this case of an apparent lung nodule that was actually a non-metallic chest port in the patient's left chest wall. Finally, prior examination errors. Prior examination errors are errors that are made due to a failure on our part to review a patient's prior studies or reports. This finding in a patient's posterior left lower lobe was interpreted as a suspicious lung nodule. However, in retrospect, a relatively recent prior chest x-ray showed that the patient had had the tip of a pulmonary arterial Swangans catheter inserted very peripherally in this exact region. And this nodule actually turned out to be a pulmonary hematoma due to pulmonary artery vessel injury. None of us is absolutely perfect, but we all endeavor to be as close to perfect as possible, most importantly for our patients, but also a little bit for our own egos too. Understanding the different ways interpretive errors can happen and potential remedies in, uh, for these errors is an important step in avoiding these sorts of problems in the future.